Your commentator is Joe O'Brien. The summer of 1933 is a long time ago in aviation, and yet the late Italo Balbo, Air Marshal of Italy, led a fleet of seaplanes across the Atlantic to the Chicago World's Fair. This country's enemies today have planes far superior to those of 10 years ago. Tremendous strides have been made in aviation since then. For example, this huge United States Army plane, capable of carrying enormous loads with an unstop range that is a military secret. And here's a Navy plane, not by any means the largest of our Navy's aircraft, but literally a flying battleship. Our enemies, too, have these long-range weapons. The Office of Civilian Defense is furnishing volunteers everywhere with the means of acquiring knowledge for our protection. The Air Raid Warden is one of the most important of all civilian volunteers. When enemy aircraft appear, civilian spotters scattered over the countryside report location, approximate altitude, and type of bomber flying in to launch an attack. The spotter makes his way at once to the nearest telephone and is connected to the closest Army filter center when he lifts the receiver and says, Army flash. As reports from civilian spotters are received at the secret filter center, the positions of the approaching bombers is plotted on the map and changed as reports come in. Watching the approach of the enemy on the big map, Army officers telephone commands to the various dispersal fields where fighter squadrons are ordered into the air to intercept the raiders. Cities and towns are warned in line of the enemy flight. And here the air raid warden service becomes a vital part of the split second action needed for civilian defense. The basic unit of civilian defense is a sector containing the homes of about 500 people. This may be one apartment house or a suburban residential section. In small communities, wardens hearing the air raid alarm report at once to their post, which may be the headquarters of the chief warden or the zone warden in a section of a larger city. At headquarters, wardens reporting for duty obtain their equipment and go immediately to the sector to which they have been assigned. The chief warden remains at the post to receive and forward messages. On patrol, the warden's first duty is to clear the streets, directing drivers of automobiles to park at curbs and seek shelter. In the large cities, the air raid warden's job is more difficult. It is not easy to control efficiently the people and traffic at such a busy crossroads as Times Square, New York City. But the air raid wardens have done it. And here it is, ready for an attack, all traffic halted. In small towns, the warden also must warn pedestrians into shelter positions, the location of which has been previously determined. The warden is not a policeman, fireman, or doctor, but his duties are related to all three. In Seattle and other West Coast cities, a night alert may at any time become the real thing, and a complete blackout is immediately obeyed. Enemy planes have been reported seen over this area and practice air raid alarms are taken seriously. Pedestrians sent to shelters go without urging. One of the warden's jobs at night is to warn householders of any uncovered light that can be seen from the street. If he fails to obtain immediate cooperation, his duty is to report the violation to the police. After streets are cleared and lights covered, he takes up a protected position where he can observe events it will be his duty to report. A minimum of 10 hours study in practice must be devoted to first aid 
as prescribed by first aid authorities. Here is a class of wardens being shown the real meaning of first aid in the case of a fracture. There are no splints available, but a magazine serves the purpose until a doctor's services can be secured. This is all that the practice of first aid requires, rendering effective assistance before the doctor comes. But to be effective, first aid requires knowledge and training. Should an artery be severed and a tourniquet necessary, the instructor demonstrates the proper position of the bandage in the case of a forearm wound and then uses a stick or a fountain pen to twist it and shut off the artery. The class will be impressed also with the necessity of loosening the tourniquet at proper intervals. Knowledge of approved methods of fighting incendiaries is also a vital part of a warden's training and a minimum of three hours is required at lectures and drills arranged by local fire departments. Five hours minimum time is required for lectures on war gases and these should be conducted by specially trained instructors or reserve officers. This class is witnessing a helpful demonstration of gas odors. A mustard gas, for example, one of the deadliest of gases, has the odor of garlic. Chlorpicrin in the air will immediately remind anyone of old-fashioned flypaper. It has that sweet, sticky smell. Once these odors fill the air, the gas alarm should be sounded. Diphenylchlorocene has the unmistakable odor of shoe polish. Phosgene warns of its presence with an odor of green corn. And lewisite has the heavy odor of a geranium. Large apartment houses, factories everywhere, and the small home especially should be prepared. It is in the attic of such a home that the greatest fire hazard exists. Odds and ends of trash and junk should be removed until there is nothing left to spread fire quickly all over the room. On the stairs leading to the attic, pails of water and other firefighting equipment should be ready for use. When the warning is heard, gas burners should be turned off. There should be facilities ready for using water to extinguish fires caused by incendiary bombs. And although water pressure may fail, it is well to have means for attaching the garden hose to ordinary house faucets. Don't let a crack of light show to the outside. Any heavy material can be used to black out windows. No special blackout equipment needs to be bought. There should be a refuge room where furniture can be used to protect the family from glass splinters, the cause of most casualties. For complete safety, the blackout should be maintained throughout the night. Although American troops are going overseas by the thousands, the air raid warden is a soldier no less than the man who goes to the actual fighting fronts. Gone is the day when only the armed forces go forth to war, leaving civilians immune and safe at home. No matter who they are, where they are, men or women, air raid wardens are in the army now. <laughs>